Peace, my name is Brandon B. Mike Odoms. I'm a visual artist. Justice to me is our collective ability to build, to thrive, to love, to exist without any opposition. You are watching Justice Now, a BET Town Hall with your host, Mark Lamont Hill. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. We are living through an important moment in history, and we wanted to come together tonight to speak about what this moment means for America and how we can carry this moment forward to create lasting change. Before we begin our town hall tonight, we wanted to take a brief look back at the last two weeks, which have shaken America and the world. We cannot have two justice systems in America, one for black America and one for white America. People are mistreated in the community and expect me to do better. We would like to join with them and to improve the way we police. Children need to have an example that justice is still here. Justice for black people. Justice for all black people. The killing of George Floyd, coming on the heels of the fatal shootings of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, have caused people to rise up against injustice. And tonight, I'm joined by you at home and some important voices in the fight for racial justice. But I want to begin tonight's show with a conversation I had earlier. It was with a woman who is also a leader in the fight for justice. She's also a woman many believe could soon become the next vice president of the United States. She's the founder of the voting rights group Fair Fight Action, and she's the author of the soon-to-be-released book, Our Time Is Now, Power, Purpose, and the fight for a fair America. Joining me now is former Georgia State Representative Stacey Abrams. Representative Abrams, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. When you saw that tape of George Floyd on the ground with that officer, uh, his knee on top of him, what was your reaction? Sadly, my reaction was not surprise. And that is, I think, what is fomenting the rage and the anguish that we're seeing across this country. We are no longer surprised by a man who is screaming to a police officer, I can't breathe, because we saw that happen with Eric Garner. We are no longer surprised by the murder of men and women by the police because we just heard about it with Breonna Taylor. And in the state of Georgia, Ahmaud Arbery's murderers were allowed to go home because his life wasn't considered valuable enough to even pursue an arrest. I wasn't surprised, but my God, I was... I am saddened and I remain enraged along with everyone else that we live in a society where we have to continue to fight for the basic treatment of humanity. And the systemic inequities and the systemic injustices are solvable, but we have to fight to solve them. And that's what I commit to. We've seen black death, uh, particularly from the state, is not uncommon. We've seen this so many times, but we don't always react the same each time. Why do you think we saw such mass action and such mass reaction around the country uh, for this particular case of George Floyd? I think George Floyd was the catalyst, but there's a reason I also invoke the murders of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, because they happened in succession and they strained our ability to be silent. But we also have to recognize that this is happening in the midst of COVID-19, where more than 107,000 Americans have died, and a disproportionate number of them have been African American. We also know that the people who are being forced on the front lines to be essential workers who are often underpaid, and the ones who are not getting their stimulus checks, and the ones who do not have access to PPE, and the ones who are being treated the worst through this process are Black and Brown folks, primarily Black people. We know that we live in a society that has devalued us, but we have never seen, I think, in this modern age, the confluence of both our justice system denying our humanity, but also our government denying our desire to survive. And I think between the public health crisis, the economic disaster, and the continued proof of systemic injustice, people have had enough, and they understand that if they don't lift their voices now, 
More will come and it will only get worse if we do not stop it today. There are many peaceful marches that are taking place. Others have been more intense. We've seen all sorts of things happening from looting to the tearing down of buildings. How do you respond to or make sense of people who say that they've had enough and they don't want just peaceful marches? I think we have gotten confused between what is peaceful and what is silent and quiet. And the reality is that there is a deep anger, a deep rage, but also a deep pain that is being felt and expressed. In 1992, when I participated in the response to Rodney King, there was this attempt to draw a distinction between the march that I helped to lead to City Hall and the protests that occurred across the street next to the housing projects. And part of my responsibility then as a, an activist and today as a political leader is to understand and contextualize that there are going to be ways to communicate that rage and that pain. And our responsibility is to create responses that mitigate and that answer the question, what next and what can we do? One of the responses to what's happening on the ground came from the White House. Uh, President Trump uh, offered words a few days ago uh, regarding what he thought the governmental response should be to uh, the rebellions that were taking place on the ground. I want you to take a look and let me know what you think. I am mobilizing all available federal resources, civilian and military, to stop the rioting and looting, to end the destruction and arson, and to protect the rights of law-abiding Americans, including your Second Amendment rights. Today, I have strongly recommended to every governor to deploy the National Guard in sufficient numbers that we dominate the streets. When you hear that type of language, dominating the streets, uh, the, the invocation of the Second Amendment, uh, what sort of things uh, does it conjure for you? One, it conjures up the desire to have, once again, a president who actually understands the Constitution and, more importantly, understands our democracy. This is a coward and a bully who uses strongman language and whose response to every crisis is to use dog whistle politics that have now gone beyond dog whistle to just direct uh, invocation of violence against communities that he considers subhuman. You notice that in that narrative, he, for some reason, evoked the Second Amendment as though that was the challenge at, 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 at hand. What we hear from the putative president of the United States is his cowardice that is even more exemplified by the fact that he has now barricaded himself inside the White House and is afraid to cross the street in front of peaceful protesters without tear gas and rubber bullets. What I hear is a cry for help, and we should help him by removing him from office in November. People are voting against something if they decide to remove Trump from office, as you're suggesting, but they also are voting for something, in this case, uh, Democratic nominee Joe Biden. Uh, there are some people who are calling for you to potentially be a running mate uh, for uh, uh, Vice President Biden. Uh, what do you make of those rumors? Uh, you've talked about them a bit, but where, where, where do you stand now? What I've always said is when asked the question, I always answer that I'd be honored to serve. But what I will say is that I, I want to push back against anyone who sees this as a lesser of two evils conversation. For the first time in a long time, we have true evil. I don't think Donald Trump himself, but we have a Republican Party that has dehumanized, devalued, and put into the courts the blocking of progress. And that means we have to vote for someone who is who has openly said that he is willing to profess change and to create change, who left the safety of his home not to go and do a showpiece in front of a burned out church, but to go inside that church and be in conversation. I support Joe Biden and whatever decision he makes, because I know that he is the best solution to the moral rot that is currently inside the White House. Representative Abrams, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill. I appreciate being here. Representative Stacey Abrams uh, offering some really important insights on the moment that we're in. And joining us tonight is a whole panel of people who will be helping us make sense of what's going on uh, in the world and at this exact moment. But the first person I want to go to is Brittany Packnett Cunningham. She is an activist. She is a brilliant voice of this generation. And the first thing I want to ask you, Brittany, is how are you making sense of this moment? 
Representative Abrams spoke to uh, the need to get people organized, to get people to not just be on the ground, but also to get people into the ballot box. How close are we to achieving that goal? I think that we are closer, perhaps, than we've ever been before. This is a moment that our ancestors have brought us to, that our foremothers and fathers have brought us to, that activists and scholars and thinkers and leaders um, who are Black have brought this entire country to. What we are experiencing now is a level of frustration that is commensurate and actually matches the depth of harm that continues. The urgency we're seeing in the streets needs to be matched by the amount of urgency we're seeing with people who hold the power in their hand and making sure that, yes, we reduce harm, but mostly that we in engage in the kind of radical and transformational changes that are really going to keep Black people safe. I'm glad you used that language, radical and transformational changes. I want to bring in Color of Change President Rashad Robinson. Uh, Rashad, thanks so much for joining us as well. Uh, the language that Brittany's using and the language that I'm hearing on the streets and really around the country is that of radical change, radical transformation. What does that look like? What does an agenda that actually transforms society for Black people look like? We start putting our money uh, where our mouth is, where our intentions are. You know, police budgets have um, become incredibly swelled over the last um, several decades as more and more things uh, get defunded in our communities from education, from healthcare, from mental health, and all get put into law enforcement. And so what we are dealing with is issues of power. And right now, in order to actually overcome the forces that stand in our way, we have to deal with the fraternal order of police. And every time we bring up the type of reforms, the type of changes, whether they be radical or incremental, in front of us stands um, a set of uh, infrastructure that pretends like there's no issue at all. I have sat in meetings at the White House where the head of paternal police has said things like, all of this talk of racial profiling is new to him. So how do we make change when the people on the other side pretend the, the, the issue doesn't even happen? It, it's fascinating that you say that, right? That it's new to them. Uh, it's old to Black folk. We know our struggle. We know what's been going on. And it's very easy for people to turn a blind eye. But at this moment, it seems like we're no longer doing that. And what I'm loving so far is that you and Brittany aren't talking about traditional liberal reform. Y'all are talking about actually changing the world as we know it, changing the way we do community, changing the way we understand who we are, changing the relationships between police and community. That's a different kind of vision. And that's the kind of stuff we're trying to do here tonight. So we're just getting started, y'all. Stay with us. Much more to come. Ahead on Justice Now, a BET town hall. From Ferguson to Minneapolis, cries heard around the world. But what's different this time? And later, inherent racism in America. Tough talk about who is truly responsible. White people know better and they can do better. Whose job is it to fix it? Our BET Town Hall, Justice Now, will continue in a moment. And none of us will be safe. So today, we pushed the army away from our city. Our soldiers should not be treated that way. They should not be asked to move on American citizens. Today, we say no. In November, we say next. Welcome back. One of the remarkable things that has come out of the tragic death of George Floyd are the young people all around the country who have stepped forward to lead protests. And some people are surprised by that. I'm not. Brittany, what do you make of all the young people who have taken to the streets to protest? Young people are always remarkable in this moment, and the spirit of uh, youth allows for a level of imagination that actually gets us to what the data tells us, that more police do not keep communities safer, that it is not community crime or so-called black-on-black crime and that dog whistle that actually leads to more police violence. And it's most certainly investment in community activities and community programs that actually keep our community safe. Young people are bold enough to imagine those things, and they are the lead we need to follow. 
I like that kind of talk and letting young people take the lead. I want to bring in Minnesota activist Mike Griffin. He's senior organizer for Community Change Action. You've been in, the, in, in Minnesota for a long time now. You came there for school and stayed. What do you make of the current status, right, the, the next generation of young folk that come and lead? You know, they're more smarter, they're better innovative than I was back in the day. When I got uh, home from my vacation on Memorial Day, I came back to the protest happening here, and I clicked on my TV only to find the live stream. Like, like where they were at was like live streamed on Facebook, live streamed on a group called Unicorn Riot. Um, they're very savvy, and they are out there protesting in the streets. They're very, very hungry, um, and they're mad. Uh, they're tired of seeing black lives die in this city. They want to divest from the police state and make sure that we start spending money on things that actually support black lives in the city and state. They say a lot of the most committed and passionate activists are people who didn't come up in a tradition of activism. Sometimes a circumstance hits them, a crisis hits them, an injustice confronts them, and then they take the action almost as an instinct. So Mike, talk to me about what you're seeing on the ground in, in Minnesota right now. What's going on? Yeah, so this is just not one spontaneous act of anger. This is something that we have been building up in the city for the course of like five or six years. Um, Brother Philando Castile died five years ago, hands of the cops. Jamar Clark also killed. We are choosing as a city to spend $200 million a year on the police department. $200 million. Just imagine a world if we spent that on childcare or development or job training. Um, we are choosing to spend that money on a police state. Imagine a world if you spent that on a caring state. That seems like a very different vision of uh, change than two decades ago. L let me bring Rashad back in. R Rashad, there are young people on the ground who are uh, taking action right now, who had never been an organizer before. They'd never been part of a protest before. And then they saw George Floyd get killed and they needed to take action. What is that energy? What's happening? Look, that's how it starts. That's how it starts for so many of us, is that we see something and then we have to act. And then over time, you um, engage more and more and you sort of recognize the role that um, pushing and engaging can have in, in changing um, the system. What I appreciate the most um, about folks who are turning out for the first time, young people who are engaging, is that they're not encumbered by the sort of rules and norms that sometimes dictate what is possible. They can dream and imagine a future that sometimes um, uh, we, that gets stifled. Um, they, they, they can talk about sort of what, what society actually looks like and push us. And, and we are at that inflection point where we could go really far, much further than we can ever imagine. And I think that that only happens when we have people, when we have people at the center of this story and pushing on this story who uh, recognize that the rules um, and the sort of ways in which things are structured simply do not work. That's exactly right. They do not work, and we have to change them. We have to reorganize the world. And we've seen that happen before. Just in 2014, we saw that happen in Ferguson, Missouri. There were a bunch of people, not just in Ferguson and St. Louis, but around the world who saw a, an injustice. They went to Ferguson. We didn't get victory in the courts, but what we did was continue an international push to reimagine what policing looks like, to reimagine, again, what the conversation should be about state violence. You saw the expansion of Black Lives Matter, and there were so many victories because, as you pointed out, people were willing to dream more ambitiously about the world. What we did in Ferguson carried around the world. And speaking of Ferguson, it has elected Ella Jones as its first black mayor. Yes? Change can happen. We'll be right back. In my opinion, justice is all about creating a framework of accountability separate from the state that responds to violence or harm that has been caused in a productive way without causing more violence or trauma in the process. Still to come, black parenting and generational trauma. Y'all come up with a better way. We ain't doing it. Oh my God. How do we break the cycle of pain and frustration? Tough talk and sound advice. Justice Now, a BET Town Hall, continues in a moment. You're going to be right here, too. But he also got to so what I need to do right now at 16 is come up with a better way. Because how we doing it, it ain't working. He angry at 46. I'm angry at 31. You angry at 16. 
Mm. Mm. It's old, man. Simon. It's old, You man. understand me? It's old. Putting yourself in harm's way is not the way. No, it's not. You and then other your counterparts the same age and that has that same power. Y'all coming with a better way. Because we ain't doing it. Oh, my God. Oof. That clip so powerfully speaks to the generational trauma that black folk are passing on to future generations. And we want to make sure we talk about that now. I want to bring in our guest, Dr. Amani Perry. She is a professor of African-American studies at Princeton University. And she's the author of amazing book, Breathe, A Letter to My Sons. Uh, Professor Perry, when you see a video like that, what's your reaction? Oh, uh, I have so many reactions. I mean, a piece of it is, yes, it, it, it's, it's an example of how much pain there is because we have literally tried every method to access freedom, to become liberated in this country, to cease, um, you know, both the exploitation and the violence from which we're suffering. Uh, and it, over the course of literally hundreds of years. But I'll just say that another piece um, of my response and the part that gives me hope is that uh, there is, in fact, um, something really beautiful about our continued resistance and resilience and what it means to have our young people not believe in the lie of white supremacy, but believe that their struggle is righteous. And that's you know, what I hope that we hold on to. That's what it means to be black in this country is to feel that pain, to wrestle with that trauma, but to also have that resilient spirit and the belief that we can do something uh, bigger and better than we have. We have a question uh, coming in from a viewer, uh, Dr. Robert Drummond. Let's look at it. I'm extremely concerned about the trauma we're experiencing right now for ourselves and for our kids. How much exposure is too much and how do we help them get through this? I'd like to bring in former New York police officer, Corey Pagase. Corey, how, how do we deal with this, right? There's truth about police brutality. There's truth about white supremacy. We want our kids to know it. We want our, our children to see it. But we also don't want to re-traumatize them. H how do we balance those two things? Well, <clears throat> first of all, thanks for having me on this esteemed panel. The way I balance it is, it's something that we have to do with our children. For me, it's not about sugarcoating it. I'm, my personal opinion is, I want them to see everything. I want them to see it all because they need to know what America is like. Because when you leave the house, once you leave the home, you're in a melting pot. America is a melting pot. And they need to understand and know that there's some bad people in all different races. And you got to constantly reinforce and teach them how to deal with these different individuals. You know, it's so sad that we are the only race that got to sit at the coffee table like I'm sitting at right now and have that conversation with our children, what to do when stopped by the police. It's not done by any other race, any other race, only black and brown people. So I feel like the more exposure we give them to the inequities of what's going on, the better prepared that they can be to go outside. No, that makes complete sense. And as a former New York City police officer, I know you have a very particular vantage point. Let me bring back in Professor Amani Perry. Professor Perry, uh, Corey says we need to see this stuff so they can know what the world is like. The other side of that is people are saying black folk have been subjected to trauma for a long time. We go through our neighborhoods with PTSD from gang violence, from police violence, from all the, the things that come with, with poverty and racism. Is too much exposure a danger to us? Are we threatened by that? You know, I think that we have to actually respond to what's going on with our children and sustain open lines of communication. Certainly, there can be too much exposure. Part of what I write about, I think it's absolutely right. They need to know what the world they occupy is. They need to have a means of interpreting it. But we also have to give them space to be vulnerable, to feel comforted, to feel as though there's a retreat from all of that so that they can be bolstered when they go back into the world. So, you know, parenting is, is, is an art rather than a science. C Corey, as a former police officer, you have a kind of inside understanding of how police see the world. How do you use that to prepare your sons, or, or anybody's children for that matter, for what to expect when they have the talk, when they talk about getting pulled over, when they talk about walking down the street, when they talk about stop and frisk? 
How do you prepare them in a way that, that's realistic? Well, there is really no realistic way to prepare them. But the only thing that I can say, what I do, and I go around the country speaking on this subject, and I get a lot of pushback in black and brown communities because I'm steadfast on comply, then complain. But then, you know, people throw examples. Well, Philando Castillo was complying, and this one and that one was complying. But if we don't comply, it's only going to go south really, really quick. So like my sons, um, my teenage son, my son is 20 and 30. If you get, you pull them over, they're going through the drill, putting the dome light on, rolling all the windows down, anybody in the car, shut up, don't talk. I'm the only one talking. If they actually find the ID, you give it to them. Other than that, put your hands out the window so they can see that we don't have any weapons. I mean, I'm a cop, so I already know these things. And, and even those things that I'm telling you, it also makes the cop. It also makes the cop feel safe. So it's sometimes it's sometimes it's a two way street. But the racism in the criminal justice system, and especially in policing, is alive and well. And these cops are rogue. They're out of control, and there needs to be some serious change. And I know as a police officer, there's only two ways to change the system: either get rid of everybody, which you can't do, and the second thing is change the mindset. And I don't even think that can happen because to change the mindset. It has to be serious, serious reinforcement constantly, or else you wouldn't. We would never have a, a second "I can't breathe" murder. Now, I know you said you can't get rid of everybody. What's interesting is one of the big calls on the ground uh, for, from activists is to defund police departments, to reimagine the world in a way where we may not need police in the same way that we do. I know for a former police officers, that could be. A, a, a radical vision, but it's something that young people are talking about. It's something we're going to keep talking about. I want to thank you for joining me, and I want to th keep to ask you all to stay right here because we got much more coming up in a minute. To me, justice means the demilitarization of police. What would it look like if police were taught more about community engagement than how to use a gun? Coming up next on our BET Justice Now Town Hall. Dear white people, real talk about how they can eradicate racism. Please don't come close to me. Please take your phone off. Please don't come close to me. Please, please call the cops. Please call the cops. I'm going to tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. Please tell them whatever you like. Welcome back. Black people bear the burden of racism, but we cannot solve it. That's white people's work. White people need to do that. There's a woman, Jane Elliott. She's an anti-racism she's an anti-racism activist. She's an educator, and she made an online video telling white people to stand up, and it has gone viral. And I want y'all to see this. Check it out. I want every white person in this room who would be happy to be treated as this society in general treats our citizens, our black citizens, if you as a white person would be happy to receive the same treatment that our black citizens do in this society, please stand. You didn't understand the directions. If you white folks want to be treated the way blacks are in this society, stand. Nobody's standing here. That says very plainly that you know what's happening you know you don't want it for you. I want to know why you're so willing to accept it or to allow it to happen for others. Ooh, that's one of my favorite videos. Let me go talk about this. Joining me right now is Brittany Cooper. She's Associate Professor of Women's and Gender Studies and Africana Studies at Rutgers University. Uh, Professor Cooper, one of the things I love about that video is she doesn't just point out the, the stark realities between black and white folk and white people can go, oh, I didn't know. No, she said, y'all already know. Y'all know what this is. How important is it for us to, to not let white people off the hook in that way? I mean, look, I don't know that black people have ever let white people off the hook. I think if you look at our history, that we have been calling them to account really since they stole us from the shores of Mother Africa. But what white people have is access to power. And the problem is that what they keep on deciding is that the lure of whiteness and all of the privileges that come with it really does trump every other thing, that that they care about it more than they care about money. So this is when you'll see white people often vote against their own economic interests, like in the campaign of 2016, because they care more about the allure and the power that comes with whiteness. So this isn't necessarily about their ignorance. It's about a very 
about a deliberate kind of obliviousness, right? So white people choose to not know certain things. There's a philosopher named Char named Charles Mills, and he says that whiteness is in, what he calls, it's a complicated term, but he says it's an epistemology of ignorance, which means it's predicated on a refusal to see certain things. But when you confront them, like what we saw with Amy Cooper when she call the cops on Christian Cooper, you find out that white people are very aware of how power works and that they're often acting in ways to maintain that power. And that's what's so hard because we like to tell this narrative as that white people are innocent and black people just need to use the time to raise their consciousness. But just when they tune in, even just a little bit, white people know better and they can do better. And we have to begin from that point of view in order to really push them to stop killing black folks or to stop standing around being bystanders when it's happening. Dr. Cooper, you just shook me a little bit in a good way, right? Because now I'm thinking, you're saying white folk know and they have an investment in keeping the status quo the way it is, even if it really don't help them. They'd rather be white than be free, it sounds like you're saying. That's precisely it in a nutshell. Look, one of the harder truths that I've reflected on this moment, and I've tried to figure out how to reflect on it without being incendiary, but which I say to white folks when I get opportunities to talk to them in broad audiences, is there are a couple of legacies that you have in this country. One is the legacy of the slaveholder and the plantation master, but the other is the legacy of the abolitionist. And that legacy should tell you two things. One, you always have a choice about what kind of white person you want to be, but two, recognize that there was a, a physical battle in which white people had to take up arms against other white people to get them to do and treat black people with any level of dignity and, res and respect. That's actually what it took, that we didn't get anything akin to freedom in this country until white people were willing to be violent. And I'm not saying that is an advocacy of violence at all, but I'm saying that white people need to become very clear, particularly those who are liberal-minded and those who are on the side of justice about what it's going to take and what they're going to have to risk in order to not let this spirit of white supremacy that is really part and parcel of the soul of America uh, stand up and take us over again. I want to bring in uh, Professor Imani Perry to give me just a, a final thought on this. How do we get past this sense of hopelessness if for hundreds of years white people have not, in, as a majority, made the moves we think they should be making? How do we convince white people at this moment that it's in their best interest for everybody to embrace an anti-racist agenda? You know, I don't know uh, the answer to how we convince them, but I do think that throwing a wrench in the works, that confronting them, that refusing them the comfort of innocence and disengagement and holding them to account, this idea that you can be a good person and actually still participate in the engine of white supremacy is just, it's simply a fallacy. Um, and so we have to make sure that white people feel uncomfortable. Right, and that requires us to feel uncomfortable because we've seen the kind of backlash we get when we make white people uncomfortable. But that is the thing, that is the only thing that has led to transformation. I just say, really quickly. In addition, you know, one of the things we make in the history of this country, we make, we make progress, and then there's a process of retrenchment. Right, we move forward on race, and then we slide backward really fast. And the question I think is. How does one sustain forward movement? And that has something to do with the transformation of the kind of human beings we say we are as members of a nation, the kind of values we hold, the kind of priorities we make. And those are, I mean, I think those things are things that have to be articulated clearly and insistently and have to become sort of constitutive. The, the foundation of who we are as human beings has to do with how we treat those who are marginalized in a society. Whew, that is a word. Professor Brittany Cooper, Professor Armani Perry, thank you so much for your brilliance and your insight. We got a lot of work to do, but white folk, you got a lot to do too. In fact, you got more. I want to thank you all for joining me. We'll be back in a minute. Justice looks like reparations. It looks like social, economic, and spiritual reckoning with slavery via free college tuition for black people, mortgage relief for black people, allocation of city funds to black and brown communities, and the commitment of white people to unlearning white supremacy. A path forward. Real solutions to a 400-year-old problem. Racism and police violence in America. Stay with us. As tragic as these past few weeks have been, 
as difficult and scary and uncertain as they've been. Uh, they've also been an incredible opportunity for people to be uh, awakened to some of these underlying trends. And they offer an opportunity for us to all work together to tackle them, to take them off, to change uh, America and, and make it live up to its highest ideals. Welcome back. That, of course, was former President Barack Obama speaking during a recent town hall on policing. One of the things that uh, President Obama attempted to do in that town hall was point out some actionable, realistic things that could be done to shift the relationship between police and communities and to reduce uh, instances of police brutality. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ambitious uh, plan, but certainly one that is doable, according to President Obama. I want to bring in Rashad Robinson again, because, Rashad, uh, the president articulated something that really involves local politics, local governance, actions from mayors. How do we get there? Well, I mean, we're already getting there in some ways around the country. You know, a Color of Change, we've built this a movement around challenging prosecutors and holding them accountable, of changing the way that the public sees the role of prosecution and changing the way um, that prosecutors see their job. They're the most powerful actors in the criminal justice space, and there's 2,400 of them all around the country. And so while you may be looking at what's happening in Georgia or Kentucky or Minnesota, you probably live in a place right now where you have a local prosecutor that will not hold police accountable when they kill or, or harm a black person. And we have to change that. And so we've built a platform called winningjustice.org, which is the only searchable database of the 2,400 prosecutors. And so I just think this is the opportunity now for action, for people to get involved and do the things we need, need to do to translate the presence of this moment, the visibility, the awareness, into the power to change the rules. And that has to be part of the work that we do um, to change things. And so whether it's mayors or whether it's local elected officials, whether it's prosecutors or city councils, these folks have to be nervous about disappointing us. Yeah, Rashad, we have a final uh, viewer submitted question for you. Uh, can we go to it? Hi, Natasha Gaspard. My question is, how do we become more engaged as a community, especially at this time? I know so many people who have given up because they are tired and they don't think that their voice or their vote is gonna make a difference. For us, it's the leaders change, but things stay the same. That's a heck of a question, Rashad. There are people who wanna know their voice matters, that their vote matters, and that once they make that vote, that they'll get the change that they really wanna see. Well, here's the thing, Mark. I think it's really important um, that folks know that voting alone is not gonna save us. Voting is one piece of the civic engagement work that we've got to do. So if we just think we can go to the polls and vote and then go back home and not do the work to hold those in power accountable, I think we're not um, sort of seeing the whole system for, for how it actually operates and for how it actually works. And so, yes, voting is a piece of the puzzle, but voting is not everything. And we have to both vote and then we have to build the power. We join a local organization in your community that's working to hold the mayor and the city council and the district attorney accountable. Work to join national organizations that are working to push for change at the federal level. Um, be active in how you engage with your media environment. For the last 20 years in this country, violent crime has steadily went down. But when people are surveyed, they think violent crime has gone up. And so we have a per difference between perception and reality that's rooted in the type of content and stories that come into our homes. And so we have to challenge media about how they're portraying us. There are so many things every single day that we have to do as active participants to make change. Voting is an incredible part of it, but it's not the only part. And so we all have to get active in building the power to change the rules, to make those in power nervous, and to make change possible. Wow, powerful words, Rashad. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank all of you for joining me, including my amazing, amazing crew of experts and activists and, and just brilliant voices in the community. We want to thank you here at BET for your commitment to us. We want to thank you for your actions on the street. We want to thank you for your vision for changing things in November. We want all of you to stay safe, stay active, and remember, the time for justice is now. Good night. We need justice right now! I'm tired! I'm tired of being tired! I'm tired of watching us die! I want you to rage into the night
Regret as a burning road.